Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from AntiWar.com, and this is Anti-War News for Thursday, September 15th, 2022. First story at the top of AntiWar.com, the Senate panel okays a major change in Taiwan policy. So the Senate Armed Services Committee approved of bill on Wednesday that would radically alter U.S. policy toward Taiwan and significantly escalate tensions with Beijing. This bill, known as the Taiwan Policy Act, would give Taiwan $6.5 billion in military aid. It would give the island the benefit of being a major non-NATO ally. It would expedite arms sales to Taipei, and it would require sanctions in the event of Chinese aggression against the island. This bill was easily passed through this committee in a vote of 17 to 5. The senators who voted against the legislation were Rand Paul, Republican of Kentucky, Chris Murphy, Democrat from Connecticut, Ed Markey, Democrat from Massachusetts, Brian Schatz, Democrat from Hawaii, and Chris Van Hollen, Democrat from Maryland. So four Democrats and one Republican voted against it. The initial, so they upped the military aid in this bill. Uh, this is a, a piece of legislation that I've covered before. It was introduced, I think, back in June. Uh Bob Menendez is all about this. He's the head of this committee, the, the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee. And it the initial version would have given Taiwan $4.5 billion in military aid, but they upped that to $6.5 billion, And this aid is meant to last through 2027. So over about five uh, years, four or five years, depending on when this would become law, if it becomes law. It would be spread out, but that's significant. This is huge. Uh, over $1 billion in military aid each year for Taiwan. That would put them in the top military aid recipients along with Israel, Egypt, and now, of course, Ukraine, which has blown them all out of the wa water. But this is a radical, a bill that would radically change the U.S. policy and just be such a major provocation toward China. Um so the aid would be given to Taiwan through the Foreign Military Financing Program, which is run by the State Department, and that gives foreign governments money to buy U.S. weapons. That's how a lot of military aid is handed out. Um, the initial version would have designated, because they amended the bill, the initial version would have designated Taiwan as a major non-NATO ally. But this updated bill, it gives Taiwan, it says that it will give Taiwan the benefit of that. Uh, of that designation without technically labeling them as an ally. And these changes were made after the White House raised some concerns. And that's because under the one China policy that the U.S. follows that was established by the Taiwan Relations Act in 1979, that was the year that the U.S. formally severed diplomatic ties with Taipei and opened up with Beijing. You know, they don't recognize Taiwan as a country. So they, if they label them as an ally, that would be a very clear, uh, policy that is against the one china policy so they just tweaked that a little bit um and and the bill it's also going to create what they call a war reserve stockpile of weapons that would be placed in taiwan to be used against the chinese attack actually sorry the initial bill said that this stockpile would be placed in taiwan they changed that language to say it would be placed in an unspecified location in the region which would clearly be uh taiwan and that would be for worth 500 million worth of weapons. Um, if the legislation makes it through Congress and is signed by President Biden, it would be just the biggest overhaul of U.S. policy toward Ch China and Taiwan since 1979, since that uh, year when things were formalized. Uh, one of the biggest changes in the bill would be requiring sanctions. If China, uh, how, how the bill puts it, 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 they would have to sanction sanctioned China if it knowingly engaged in a significant escalation in aggression, which is a pretty loose definition. They could say military drills are a significant escalation in aggression, I guess, right? Because um, the U.S., the current U.S. policy is called strategic ambiguity. That means the U.S. won't say one way or the other if they will respond, if they will intervene, if China attacks Taiwan. But these sanctions would, this would, you know, requiring sanctions would change that. And Senator Paul, Rand Paul, who is against the bill, he, he said now is not the time to change this policy. He said, quote, this is not a time to radically change longstanding policy. 
without an appreciation of the consequences that may follow, end quote. The next quote is very interesting. It's from Mitt Romney, who voted in favor of the bill, but he recognized how provocative it is. He said, quote, we're doing something that's highly provocative and bellicose, end quote. Still voted for it. And China's recent actions have made clear that Beijing will re react strongly to U.S. provocations over Taiwan. The legislation comes after China launched its largest ever military exercises around the island in response to Nancy Pelosi visiting Taipei. And since Pelosi visited, as I've covered a lot, five more U.S. delegations have visited Taiwan. And Taiwan has, uh, sorry, China has really kept up the military pressure. Tensions are so high in that part of the world right now because of these stupid uh, trips by these members of Congress and some state governors have gone. And there's there's no backing down. And this what's really significant about this is that so it's September. The White House has shown some reservations about this policy. Um, there is some opposition to it from Rand Paul and, and others. Um, but even if it doesn't pass and become law this year, they would probably have to reintroduce it next year. Or maybe they would put some aspects of the bill into the NDAA. I mean, this is the Senate Armed Services Committee. This is Bob Menendez. This isn't some just bill introduced by Tom Cotton or somebody like Adam Kinzinger, some of those ultra hawks that don't, that are more fringe. Uh, this is real. This is policy that they want. This is policy that is going to happen at some point, And it's going to make war in the region much more likely as Chinese officials have warned repeatedly U S support for what they call Taiwan's independence forces will lead to, could lead to war between the U S and China. This policy should be opposed. It's completely reckless. Um, all right. The next one is related. Taiwan hosts dozens of foreign lawmakers in Washington to lobby for China sanctions. So this is according to a report from Reuters. Uh, Taiwan's de facto ambassador to the U.S. hosted about 60 lawmakers, members of parliament from countries all around the world, in Europe, Asia and Africa at Taiwan's diplomatic mansion in Washington, known as Twin Oaks. It's where Taiwan's ambassadors used to, the Republic of China, as they call themselves, their ambassadors used to live there before 1979 when they severed relations. And now it's where the de facto ambassadors go, um, who aren't technically government officials. Uh, so this meeting uh, was used to lobby for sanctions on China. It was also attended by two representatives from Ukraine who were welcomed by ta Taiwan's de facto ambassador, she said, quote, we certainly hope that as the international community stands with Ukraine, that the international community will also stand with Taiwan, that together we can deter the further aggression coming from China, end quote. The gathering came amid reports that the U.S. is considering sanctions on China to deter it from attacking Taiwan and that Taipei is lobbying the EU to take similar action. So it seems like they want to sanction China before they attack Taiwan, I guess, is is, their, is what they're considering. Um, and it really uh, just the big question is how, how much can they really sanction China without really hurting the U.S. economy? Um, the meeting, this meeting included members of the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, known as IPAC. This is a group of international lawmakers that was formed in 2020 to work against Beijing to change government policy toward China. And the U.S. representatives on this uh, in, to this group are Bob Menendez and Marco Rubio, uh, the Republican from Florida, both senators. They serve as, you know, both China hawks uh, are on this part of this group. And this group, IPAC, is holding a separate meeting in Washington this week. And according to a draft document obtained by Reuters, the group will sign a pledge to adopt what they're calling greater deterrence against military or other coercive Chinese actions against Taiwan. Um, and again, on Wednesday, the Senate, Menendez's Senate Armed Services Committee advanced that bill. So we're going to see this. And a big part of this strategy against China is diplomatic trips to Taiwan. And we're going to start seeing more. We've seen it already. I, I can't think of countries off the top of my head. But European countries are going to be sending diplomats to Taiwan. J J Japan did it recently. It, we're just going to keep seeing more of that. Um, you know, they're not going to back down on this. And China's not going to back down either. So this is just a really turning into a really volatile situation. Faster than I thought it would. Because 
the way things stand right now between the U.S. and China, I mean, a war would devastate the U.S. economy, just how intertwined they are. But it seems like this is ramping up, and it's ramping up faster than I thought. All right, uh, so the next one, we're getting into Ukraine now. Ukrainian officials publish a proposal for Western security guarantees. So Zelensky, uh, the Ukrainian president on Tuesday, he welcomed a proposal drawn up by senior Ukrainian officials and a former NATO chief that outlined a plan for security guarantees Kiev would seek from Western countries. The proposal emphasizes Ukraine's desire to become a NATO member and says that until Kiev joins the Western military alliance, it needs security guarantees from other countries. And the document says that the strongest security guarantee is for Ukraine to be able to defend itself. And it says that building up a sufficient defensive force requires, quote, a multi-decade effort of sustained investment in Ukraine's defense industrial base, scalable weapons transfers and intelligence support from allies, intensive training missions and joint exercises under the European Union and NATO flags, end quote. So a multi-decade effort. That's a long time. This is uh, what they want. The security guarantees that Ukraine seeks from other countries is a commitment for them to support Ukraine's ability to create this force through military aid, funding of reconstruction, training, intelligence sharing, and joint exercises. And according to this document, the countries that Ukraine is hoping to get security guarantees from include, but are not limited to, the U.S., the U.K., Canada, Poland, Italy, Germany, France, Australia, Turkey, and Nordic, Baltic, and Central European countries, so mostly NATO members. As part of this arrangement, Ukraine seeks a, quote, massive training and joint maneuver program of Ukrainian forces and partners on Ukrainian territory with international trainers and advisors, end quote. So they want a massive joint training maneuver with all these NATO countries in their territory. And there have been, there were pretty major NATO drills inside Ukraine before Russia invaded on February 24th. So not a lot of this really isn't new, what they're saying that they want. Uh, but Zelensky, he welcomed the plan and, and it was drawn up with the help of Anders Fogh Rasmussen. Uh, he's a former NATO secretary general, former Danish prime minister. And Zelensky said that the report should be the, va the basis of Ukraine's future security. And Russia condemned the document, of course, as the threat of NATO expansion into Ukraine was one of its main motivations for launching the invasion. Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zarkova, uh, Zakharova, sorry, I think I pronounced her name wrong there. She pointed out that many of the proposals are already being implemented as Ukraine is receiving billions in aid from Western countries. Um, and speaking of that, I want to take this time to mention our sponsor, the book, How the West Brought War to Ukraine by Benjamin Ablo. And it is about U.S. and NATO expansion eastward since the end of the Cold War and how it provoked Russia's invasion. And as we're talking about China and Russia, you always have to, sometimes it almost seems cliche to say, oh, how would the U.S. feel? Uh, if this was happening on their borders. But it's such an important point, especially if you're trying to convince somebody of, uh, you know, the, how NATO and the U.S. really provoked this war. So there's a there's a chapter in this book about that, and it's called Putting the Shoe on the Other Foot. And it opens with, um, in considering the 30-year history that he laid out in previous chapters, one must ask, how would U.S. leaders respond if the situation were reversed? say, if Russia or China carried out equivalent steps near U.S. territory. For example, how would Washington respond if Russia established a military alliance with Canada and then set up rocket installations 70 miles from the U.S. border? What would happen if Russia then used those rocket installations to conduct live fire training exercises to practice destroying military targets inside America? Would U.S. leaders accept verbal assurances from Russia that its intentions were benign? Then he goes on to explain what he thinks a likely U.S. response would be. But it's just very important. It's very well written. As you can see, it flows great. And uh, you guys should buy it. It's 10 bucks. Description. Uh, you can find the link there and buy a few copies and pass them out. <laughs> Put them in those little free libraries. I don't know if you ever see those things. They're like these little glass cases. I, I saw one today. Uh at a trail that I walked in, you know, throw a couple in, in those things. If you see them around 
where you live. Um, okay, so back to the news here. The next one, more Ukraine stuff. Senators introduce a bill to expedite re- replenishment of U.S. military weapons sent to Ukraine. So this bill was introduced last week, bipartisan by 15 uh, senators, led by John Cornyn, Republican from Texas. And really, this would just so they have to they're sending all these weapons to Ukraine from U.S. military stockpiles. And this bill would expedite the contracts uh, that they have to sign and stuff for the U.S. arms makers to replenish these stocks. So it's all really working out great for the weapons makers. And how it would do that is that it would authorize non-competitive contracts for these weapons. So I guess that would really just get rid of the bidding period uh, for uh, the Pentagon contracts. I guess they put them out um, and that companies can bid on the contract. But even though I think it's just a formality anyway, because if you're looking for a certain weapon, a certain arms maker makes it already. But anyway, so this this is likely going to pass in some form. Uh, it, right now it's a standalone legislation, but they're saying they're going to try to put it into the NDAA. And the next Ukraine aid funding that Biden is looking for, the $13.7 billion that he's asked Congress for. It includes $4. billion to replenish American stockpiles. So it has funding to do this, and they just want to do it as quick as they can. And it also includes funding to send more weapons to Ukraine from U.S. stockpiles. So this cycle, just spending just more money for the weapons makers, it's just going to keep going here. All right, the next one, Turkey calls on next Swedish government to take steps to fulfill NATO deal. So Sweden's government, uh, which is run by the Social Democrats, they're the ruling party, they conceded a defeat in the country's election on Wednesday to a coalition of what are considered in Sweden more right-wing parties. And it includes the Sweden Democrats, which are considered far right. Um, So Turkey signed a deal with Sweden. Turkey was initially blocking their attempt to join NATO. They signed a deal, lifted their objection, but they could still block it. Turkey's parliament could block it. And the main hang up is that Turkey wants Sweden to extradite Kurdish uh, suspected members of the PKK, which is a Kurdish militant group that the US, the EU and Turkey all consider to be terrorist organization. But the current government, the social Democrat government doesn't want to extradite these people. Um, so Turkey is saying the next government should, if they want to join NATO and with the Sweden Democrats, so the coalition that they're forming, it includes three other parties, the moderates, the Christian Democrats, and the liberals. <laughs> and these are all more right wing than the social Democrats. The names are definitely confusing, but uh, the Sweden Democrats are the most right wing and they are very anti-immigration. But the Swedish Democrats of the co- the new coalition, they got the most vote. So they might be more likely to say, OK, let's extradite. Kurds to Turkey. And from what I've seen, and I'll update you guys if this is different, it doesn't look like because there are right wing parties in Europe that are anti NATO, but it doesn't seem like this coalition is going to be anti NATO. I think they're still going to want to join NATO and they might be more likely to fulfill these Turkish demands. Because that's really the one thing stopping Sweden and Finland from joining NATO. The one potential thing is if Turkey blocks it. And so that's what we could hope for is that they do block it. Uh, all right. The next one, this is from the cradle and it's about the U S has released some stolen Afghan reserves, but with a catch. So the U S government announced on, on this on uh, September 13th, that it would release a significant portion of the 7 billion stolen Afghan central bank funds to a bank of international settlements in Switzerland. So the trusteeship, they're going to put $3.5 billion, half of the $7 billion that they seized in Afghan central bank funds, in this trust in Switzerland. And the idea is that it can be dispersed to help Afghanistan by bypassing the Taliban because uh, they don't want the Taliban to be able to touch this money. The Taliban has rejected the plan. Um, they want them to transfer it back to the Afghan central bank that it was taken from and the spoke, a spokesperson from the Taliban said that this, you know, 99% of Afghans are living under the, the poverty line and that they need the reserves to return to the country. So it's 7 billion that they seized, that they stole, and it's 3.5 billion that they're going to put in this trust. The other 3.5 billion, Biden signed an executive order to make it available to the 
victims of September 11th attacks, the families of the victims, even though the people of Afghanistan had nothing to do with the attacks. Um, so that they're just taking from Afghanistan. Uh, all right, the next one here. Armenia warns clashes with Azerbaijan could escalate into war. So Armenia warned on Wednesday that fresh clashes with Azerbaijan could escalate into a full-scale war and called for more global attention on the situation. Armenian Deputy Foreign Minister said that there is a clear risk of this happening when asked about the situation. So there was fresh shelling on Wednesday. I know yesterday I said that there was a ceasefire agreed to on Tuesday and that it seemed calm, but there was more shelling and there's more deaths. The total now is 155. 105 Armenian soldiers have been killed while Azer Azerbaijan has reported 50. And that was on Tuesday, so that number could be higher too. But later on Wednesday, Armenia said that the two sides had agreed to a ceasefire and that it has already taken effect. So hopefully the situation stays calm, but it does remain tense. Um, as I said, Russia said that it brokered a ceasefire on Tuesday, but it quickly fell apart. And this flare-up is the heaviest fighting since the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh War. Nagorno-Karabakh is an ethnic Armenian enclave within the internationally recognized borders of Azerbaijan. Armenia controlled territory around it. Azerbaijan took it back. Um, I shouldn't say took it back. It's a territorial dispute that I don't know too much about. I shouldn't characterize it that way. But uh, Azerbaijan took a lot of territory and Armenia ceded some territory in this ceasefire that they agreed to. There's Russian peacekeepers deployed to the area. Um, I put in a map from South Front that shows the areas where there was reported shelling. All right. So the next one here, new U.S. sanctions on Iran over alleged cyber activities. This is from Connor Freeman at the Libertarian Institute. Um, so this is as it seems that the talks to revive the JCPOA have all but failed. The Biden administration continues to pile sanctions on Iran. Treasury Department said that these new sanctions targeted what they called a group of malicious cyber actors that are allegedly linked to the IRGC. According to the Treasury Department, the sanctions hit 10 people and two entities over these accusations of that they're involved with cyber attacks. When it comes to cyber attacks, it's very hard to figure out who is behind them. And But the U.S. likes to just blame other countries for cyber attacks all the time to justify things like sanctions. Um, it's tough to really know uh, how much truth there is to these claims. But really, the story is here that we know that the sanctions, the sorry, the talks to revive the nuclear deal seem to be dead. And this is just another sign that the U.S. is expanding these sanctions. And it also comes after a U.N. special rapporteur warned that, you know, called for these sanctions to be lifted, saying they were causing food insecurity, medicine shortages, and all the stuff that we know sanctions cause. All right, the next one here is from Jason Ditz. Israeli attack halted Syria aid flights for two weeks. So the U.N. said that the recent Israeli airstrikes on the Damascus airport. Um, oh, so these are actually, so Israel just bombed the Damascus airport, uh, I think last week, very recently. So this was about airstrikes that took place in June. And they said that they did so much damage to the facility that the UN had to have all humanitarian flights into the city for two solid weeks. Um, so this is just an example of how Israeli airstrikes in Syria do damage and target civilian infrastructure. They always claim and frame these strikes that their uh, attacks on Iran. Iran has rejected that. They do have uh, a bit of a military presence in Syria. They have advisors there, but um, Israel just bombs so many targets and they kill Syrian troops a lot. And, and so it's just not what they're saying it is. And this is an example of the damage that it does to the country. All right. So the last one, we got one more here. This is from Kelly Vlahos at the at uh, Responsible Statecraft. And it's interesting, uh, Michael Anton, he is a former Trump official, and he told a recent national conservatism conference that U.S. Um, you know, mili military policies toward Russia and China are not good for uh, the country. Um, so it's just interesting because a lot of times, you know, more conservative people are are bad on China, uh, but he's saying, you know, both policies are dangerous. 
and are not good. And you guys should check that out over at Responsible Statecraft. But that is it for the news. That was a lot of stuff. I hope I uh, didn't uh, go through it too quick there because it was a lot of information. But, um, you know, the big stories, I think, is this Taiwan stuff. It's just really bad how this is escalating. But uh, you can contact the show, news at antiwar.com. Support the show, antiwar.com slash donate. Buy merch. We got new great T-shirts, coffee mugs, stickers, things like that. You can find the link in the description. Um, But that's it for me for today. I'll catch you guys uh, tomorrow with some more news. Thanks for listening.